Good morning. Welcome to everybody for joining our webinar this morning. It is now the top of the hour, 1700 UTC, so we will go ahead and begin. I do see that there are several people still joining us, but we'll first begin by going over some technical notes so that everybody can be aware of how to work this webinar. First of all, we would appreciate for you to type your questions in the chat window. You can do this um, at any point throughout the webinar, but we will have a more formal question and answer period at the end, and we'll make sure to go back and try to make sure all questions asked are answered. Also, please remember to make sure that the speaker icon above is enabled. It should be green. If it's not, you're not going to be able to hear me right now. Please check your volume levels by selecting Adjust Speaker Volume. One note is that audio and video has only been enabled for presenters during this webinar, so don't worry, we cannot see or hear you. If you have any trouble connecting or lose a connection during the webinar, please feel free to email us at science at globe.gov and we'll try to get you reconnected in joining the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our webinar website. Um, if you go down to the Globe International Scientist Network web link below, there's a webinar link on there which will direct you to the archive. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Lynn Chambers is a physical scientist in the Science Directorate at the NASA Langley Research Center. She received her PhD in aerospace engineering from North Carolina State University in 1991. Dr. Chambers is a member of the Clouds and the Earth's Radiant Energy System series science team for which she, she directs the outreach component of the series effort, which is the Students Cloud, Students Cloud Observations Online School Project. From 2003 to 2006, she was the Contrail Scientist for the GLOBE program. She currently leads the My, da My NASA Data Project to make real NASA Earth observing data accessible to the K-12 and citizen science communities. And she also currently serves as the Project Scientist for the NASA Innovations in Climate Education Project. As a partner with the GLOBE program, she is helping us develop the GLOBE International Scientist Network, which is sponsoring today's webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Lynn Chambers and thank her for giving the webinar. webinar. OK, so I will start by saying good afternoon for those of us who are on that side of the sun. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, I see at least one person, so I'll continue. So I'm going to start by saying a few words about the GLOBE International Scientist Network. Um, as most of you <clears throat> probably know, GLOBE started um, from the beginning with the idea of it being a partnership between students and scientists. And initially, this was um, handled a lot with the initial protocol scientists, but now um, is being extended to a larger network of scientists from all over the world who can work with GLOBE students and teachers both in their own region as well as using virtual tools like we're doing today. And each partnership with those scientists can be um, unique and different depending on the local needs. And of course, as with all of GLOBE, the idea is to inspire young minds, um, include international collaborations, and leverage the data that's available in the GLOBE database. If you're interested, uh, there are some qualifications for joining, and you can find some information on that on the GLOBE website. Um, and then you can look into how you can mentor students and teachers, visit classrooms, write blogs. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can be involved. Um, and the map here shows just a few of the members that are currently um, in the GLOBE International Scientist Network. And I realize that the map is cut off, so it doesn't even show the entire world. So with that introduction, I'm going to talk about um, my personal experience as a scientist in the K-12 classroom. And the title that I've chosen for this talk is Adventures of a Scientist in the K-12 Classroom because I do feel like each time it is an adventure. And I think um, if you can think of it as an adventure, then it's um, perhaps a more positive experience to have. Um, so just kind of by way of introduction, I've been visiting classrooms personally since January of 1997. Um, don't want to count how many years that's been. And I have been in 
classrooms from kindergarten through high school, um, every grade level in between. I also do a lot of work with teachers, so I get to see that end of the process as well. And I've been lucky enough to do in-person visits on two continents, both the US and Europe, and have also in recent years been able to do virtual visits to schools in South America, in Central America, um, have one coming up in Europe this week, um, as well as to schools in the US. Um, my visits have been anywhere from low to high tech um, with classrooms that have uh, the interactive whiteboards, as you can see in the picture here, to a classroom that doesn't even have an overhead projector. And I've been in classrooms um, both as a guest speaker, kind of an invited guest, as well as doing hands-on activities with elementary school kids um, and kind of everything in between. Uh, the picture here is actually an example of something that I do not recommend. This is a picture, a recent picture. I went and visited a local elementary school and actually spoke to 10 of the students, uh, fourth grade students, in a room by myself. And one thing that I will tell all of you as you think about doing this is um, you should generally not be in a room by yourself without the teacher present. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but in the US, actually, it is required for the teacher to be in the room. Um, so just one thing to keep in mind. If the teacher does try to leave the room, follow them out. OK, so some lessons learned that I've distilled from my adventures in the classroom. Um, first of all, kids are not scientists. So when I first started visiting schools, um, I had been a scientist for about 10 years, um, about six years post-PhD, and I had been in the habit of going to scientific meetings. And at a scientific meeting, you stand at the podium and you talk about your slides and everyone listens to you. Um, this is not a good approach for the classroom. Um, kids are not scientists. They are not there to learn from your vast wisdom um, they need other things. So move around, um, ask questions, engage the kids in thinking about what you're talking about. Don't just lecture to them. Um, another key thing that I have learned from interactions with some very good educators around me is um, that they are experts at what they do. I mean, we scientists are expert scientists, but teachers are expert teachers, and so they can provide some really useful tips in terms of things that work in their classroom and things that don't work in their classroom. Uh, more lessons learned. Don't expect perfection. Um, as I said, I've been doing this for more than 15 years now. Um, every classroom is different. Every age level is different. Uh, even experienced educators can sometimes struggle to engage kids and get them to listen and follow and pay attention. So when you go into a classroom, you shouldn't expect that the kids are going to hang on your every word. Um, you need to be prepared with, as I said, some interaction, um, engaging the kids as much as you can engage the kids, keeps them out of trouble. And other things, when you go into a school, um, be flexible. I've had some very odd um, things happen. Um, I arranged a visit to an elementary school in Michigan a few years ago, and I had just barely gotten started, and the tornado drill uh, came on. And so we all had to go into the hallway and lie down in the hallway with our heads to the wall. What can you do? Um, and then the, the final lesson learned here is um, expect to keep learning. Again, I've been doing this for a long time. I recently visited a local high school and had a completely different experience than I've ever had before. So expect every time to be different. Expect to keep learning. Uh, another key point um, for scientists in particular is to remember the basics. Um, so when, when 
we're scientists, we're trained to always be working on the cutting edge, to be trying to find something new that nobody else knows. And when we go to present, we try to present the latest and greatest discovery that we've made um, to show how, that, how we've advanced the cutting edge of research. If you go talk to a fourth grade classroom, fourth graders need to learn basically the same thing every year, and they need to learn pretty much the same thing that fourth graders needed to learn when you were in school. Um, and so it's important to remember that the biggest role that you can play is as a motivation for learning. Um, so bringing some of the real world connections. So um, if you can, in advance of going out, learn a little bit about the curriculum requirements that your teacher has. Perhaps you can do that by talking to the teacher directly, or you can do that by looking at some of the state or national level education standards that are out there. And figure out how you can draw connections between the fundamental concepts that they're learning in that classroom and some of the exciting things that you're doing in your research. And again, that's really the most important role I think we can play as scientists is to motivate the students to understand why they need to learn some of these things that they don't really see a reason to learn in their day-to-day -day activity. Uh, another thing to really remember is language. Um, and there are a number of resources where you can find some of this information. But in the web links box, there's a link to the article that contains this table if anyone wants to follow up further. Um, so this is a collection of words that uh, Susan Hassel has been collecting over time where it's a word that has a specific meaning to a scientist and a different meaning to the general public. And of course, this list is in English. I'm sure there are similar lists that could be um, created for other languages. So for example, when you say a positive trend, to a scientist, all that means is that whatever it is you're looking at is going up. That's not a value judgment. It could be a good thing that it's going up. It could be a bad thing that, that's going up. But to the public, positive trend is a good thing. Positive feedback is a good thing. Um, and so instead, you may want to use a different word, um, like upward trend, to take out that value. Or in some cases, you may want to actually use one of these terms. But if you do that, uh, it's a good idea, it's probably a really good idea, to go ahead and define what that term means. Um, so for example, the term anomaly is something that comes up in the presentations that I tend to do for students. And so what I've done is, um, rather than try to take that out of all my slides and all my graphs that I show them, um, to actually explain to them what that means and get them to understand it in a way that they can relate to. Um, so the example that I often use is um, the analogy of body temperature. So um, in Fahrenheit, body temperature is, normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine a project where you're a student and you're going to take your body temperature for a month. And you're going to plot it on a graph. And so as a good trained math student, all math students get told you know, how to make their scale. So the scale should go from 0 to 100. right? And so they're going to make a scale of a graph that goes from 0 to 100. And then they're going to take their body temperature and plot it on that graph. So first day, 98.6. Second day, 98.6 third day, 98.6. OK, so you start seeing this flat line at the top of the graph. Fourth day, 101. OK, well, that's a bad choice because it goes over the graph. But, but the idea is um, if you plot that on a scale of 0 to 100, 
that 101 is just a very small blip. But we know from anybody who has had a fever that 101 is pretty uncomfortable. And so the anomaly, the purpose of the anomaly is to take out that known average, the normal value, and show the changes from that average. Um, so again, any of these terms, if uh, it makes sense for you to use them in the context of whatever topic you're talking about, try to think of a way to explain that um, to the students in a way they understand um, and make sure they understand it by engaging them in conversation about it. So I've told you a lot of lessons learned that some of them are not so pleasant as with all lessons learned. Uh, but the bottom line, in my opinion, is that it, it is worth it to get out into the classroom as a scientist, whether through the GLOBE International Scientist Network or some other way. Um, and the reason for that is because studies show that a very small fraction of people actually know a scientist personally. And so the stereotypes of scientists, like the cartoons that you see on this um, page, or like the stereotypes of shows in the US like Big Bang Theory are all that a lot of people know. And so it's important for us real scientists to get out there in the classroom and show kids that we are in fact people just like them and that they can be just like us or at least that they can learn some things about science that can help them. So that's my bottom line. And I'd be happy to address questions or any discussion that might be out there. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. I'm going to go ahead and ask for anybody that wants to ask some questions to please type them in the chat window at the bottom left of your screen. Okay, I see a question from Amy. What's the best way to find teachers that are interested in having scientists visit? Um, in the context of this discussion, I think the best way is to try to work through your local GLOBE partners and see if they can recommend some um, schools in the area that you might be able to make connections with. Um, for those of you who might not be able to do that, there are other resources like contacting your local school district, or a local university uh, to try and find schools and teachers. Uh, yes, the webinar is being recorded, and maybe Sarah can provide instructions on where you'll be able to find that. Oh, okay, question from Valentina. Do you know if the climate change website of NASA is going to be translated to Spanish? I do not know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that there is an email contact on that website, and you could go ahead and send that question to them um, and see if they can respond.
see a bunch of people are typing. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you usually develop your own lesson plans and activities? Um, I do generally, um, and that's because the visits that I've made to the classroom have been mostly for my own projects. Um, with GLOBE, there's a number of activities uh, that are available in the teacher's guide, um, learning activities, and a variety of things that are already developed that you could certainly use, um, or things that you might use in a GLOBE training, or that you've seen in a GLOBE training could certainly be used as well. Uh, the other thing that I will say about that is that there's a website, and I'll put it in here. Um, there's a fairly new website from NASA that um, has a lot of resources on Earth and space science education. And so there may be some ideas there for hands-on activities or, or lessons or activities that you could use in the classroom. OK, Karen asks, elaborating on why it's important to have the teacher present when you're on classroom visits. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. One is to protect you um, from any accusations of inappropriate behavior. The other is um, that the teacher is responsible for the classroom, and they are responsible for managing the behavior of the students. So as a scientist going into the classroom, you should be able to focus on the topic, the content that you're dealing with, and not have to worry about as much um, how to make sure that the, the kids are behaving, that they're on task, that sort of thing. So it, it is important um, to have that. And as I mentioned, in, in at least some states in the US, it's actually legally required that the student, that the teacher be present with the students. Okay, do you have, do you know any grant that I can apply to give talks to schools or the public? I'm a marine scientist. So, Valentina, where are you located? Um. I guess I, and while we're waiting for that answer, I'm not personally aware of such things, but I do know in, in the United States, many grants that you get from the National Science Foundation, NASA, NOAA, other organizations, require what they call broader impacts. And so that is a way that, that researchers in the US certainly can get a small amount of funding that can support activities like talking with schools or uh, interacting with the public. Um, I don't know whether that's a practice in any, any other countries, but if it's not, perhaps that's something that you could try to suggest to your um, funding agencies. Okay, I don't see anyone else typing, so that may be the end of the question. So I'd like to wish you all well in your own adventures in the classroom. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. I really appreciated hearing about your adventures, and I hope to all the attendees that um, make their own adventures that we will hear from them and that they will consider joining the Globe International Scientist Network so that we can all work together as one big network to communicate the importance of science and why it's important to learn science to students, as you mentioned, to be those motivators for students to really get interested in why science is relevant and important in their lives.
So this webinar is being recorded. I've added the GISN webinar archive link to the web links box. So you can click there. This is the second webinar that we've hosted. And so you'll see our previous one already listed in the archive. This one from today will hopefully be posted later um, this afternoon. Uh, so please check back in a few hours for that posting. Uh, if anybody else has questions, please continue to type them. And you can always email us at science at globe.gov. Thank you so much for your attendance.